guys, it's Charlie, and I'm super excited to be sharing with you my first ever YouTube video on my YouTube channel. <laughs> All I know is what anyone tells me to do. Dictating every decision I made through what other people said. I was only surrounded by a bunch of adults. In a world that is as cruel as it is deceitful, tragedy is ignored in pursuit of a happy mind. Those who seek more venture beyond the veil, they venture into the vortex. One day you could be a regular kid, and the next, a star. The reigning first family of social media. Just how much money the D'Amelio family rakes in every Earning year. Brand deals, acting gigs. Such as Tamagotchi, Dunkin' Donuts, and Hollister pay Charlie hundreds of thousands of dollars. Along with the parents that leech off their daughters. I know they're going to look back on this ride as it being incredible. We went home and cried all night. I don't even know if I want to do this anymore. Like, this is messed Down up. in tears on Insta Live. From over 150 million followers, a business failure and a brand nightmare. How does an influencer brand collapse this catastrophically? How are you going to have 56 million followers and only 85 comments? Having 58 million followers and only 7,000 likes is crazy. At the core, their businesses had no soul. They look like sellouts. Just because you have millions and millions of followers does not mean people are gonna wanna buy from you. With the rise of social media, the celebrity status has drastically changed. The Melio Show. In just a few short years, our next guest went from social media stardom to building an empire as one of the most off. famous families in the world. Please welcome back the D'Amelio family, Mark, Heidi, Dixie, and Charlie. Charlie, good to see you guys. A curse I personally wouldn't wish on anyone. I have had a lot of issues with anxiety. I used to have like 10 to 15 huge panic attacks a day. Oh my God, she's so musty. I'm like, shut the f up, like stop. There are incredible things that I get to do and get to learn and get to experience, but it's not what I thought it was. As the pussycat dolls say, be careful what you wish for you just might get it. Oftentimes, those who search for fame think it'll be the answer to all of their problems. But those who are famous, while talking about the privilege that it does grant them, also often talk about how isolating of an experience it is. I don't think you could ever truly be prepared or made for this. The daughters of the D'Amelio family, Charlie and Dixie D'Amelio, became famous through the platform TikTok. They became known worldwide practically overnight when they were just teenagers. And all of a sudden, managers, producers, industry experts, and worst of all, their own parents became massively involved in Charlie and Dixie's TikTok brand. Mark, you started a, a shoe line and snacks aside from the show. What's it like as a, a family, you know, <laughs> controlling and working this business here? But there have also been many consequences to this overnight fame. Backlash, controversy, burnout, and mental health issues. I used to have this thing that not a lot of people know about, and I don't know if I've ever like really talked about it, but it's called trichotillomania. And yeah, my panic attacks and anxiety attacks would make me pull my hair out. It can be a dangerous, greedy, cruel world where vultures circle the vulnerable. What's going on? I'm so <laughs> And at this point, as a viewer, I'm just thinking enough is enough. I mean, an overarching theme since season one has been Dixie being overworked, and while she reveals that she has PMDD, I think that since January of 2020, both of these girls have been going nonstop, partly due to their own fame, and the other part being their manager forcing brand deals on them. And if you let them prey upon you, the delicate social media stardom that you built for yourself can so easily collapse. This may just be the story of what is happening to the D'Amelio brand and why recently it's been falling off and failing. Now it's no secret that the era of TikTokers being the most talked about thing in the world is kind of over. Hello friends and internet acquaintances, welcome or welcome back to another video on my channel covering controversial internet figures. 
If you like those sorts of topics, then don't forget to subscribe. And if you like this video, then don't forget to give it a like if you want to. Arlie and Dixie D'Amelio had a very unconventional rise to fame. But before we cover the D'Amelio's rise into fame and how Charlie and Dixie's parents got involved in their success and their brand, Let's talk about a sponsor for today's video. I almost signed up for the same streaming platform twice using a different email account because I forgot I already had an account with them. Luckily, I was signed up with Rocket Money and was able to notice it before spending weeks or months stupidly paying for the same subscription twice. The sponsor Rocket Money can help with problems like this. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions, lower bills, and manage your money better. My partner and I have been using Rocket Money for almost a year at this point, and I've found it to be a really helpful tool when it comes to financial management and ensuring that I'm staying on track and not spending any money that isn't necessary or making any major financial mistakes. I love using Rocket Money to safely and securely identify reoccurring charges and cancel unwanted subscriptions. You can even cancel from within the app with just a couple of taps. No need to worry about annoying customer service calls. Rocket Money has helped save its customers up to $740 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. See how you can save and try out a seamless way to cancel unwanted subscriptions. Utilizing Rocket Money's free trial when you sign up using my link. Save money and spend less. Join the over 5 million using Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash cruelworldhappymind or click the link in my description and get started for free. Charlie D'Amelio was the first of her family to download TikTok all the way back in 2017, when the platform was pretty relatively unknown. After its parent company, ByteDance, spent nearly $1 billion to purchase the app Musical.ly, Charlie D'Amelio wouldn't upload her first TikTok until March of 2019. It's crazy. I think back to growing up and I literally always was filming myself. I have videos of myself and I was like, it's been six on my big computer in the house, just dancing for hours. Charlie's first TikTok on her page is a pretty typical TikTok for a teen of her and her friend just lip syncing to a random soundbite. Hey, did you know one out of three hoes are mad? For real? Well, I'm not mad. I'm not mad either. Soon after, Charlie started uploading casual dance videos that she filmed in her bedroom. TikTok dance routines became a really popular trend, especially among young teens. And Charlie had a leg up, maybe literally, as Charlie grew up as a trained dancer. Were you always into dancing and just... I've been training and dance since I was three. I actually started competing when I was five. With this app, it's just it's like yeah. perfect. This no, dance has been a part of my life since... Ever. She began dancing at the age of three and practiced dance competitively. I was always super into dancing. I used to train sometimes seven days a week. Being a dancer my entire life, it wasn't like I decided I'm going to do dancing on TikTok. A lot of people think that TikTok dances aren't that hard or complicated, but honestly, when I've seen them, they look pretty challenging to me. If you can do a TikTok dance, that's impressive. Credit to you for even possessing the basic coordination skills that I clearly lack. Charlie described her life before TikTok as being very normal. I would go to school, go to dance, do my homework, and go to bed. It was pretty much like every other teenager's life. But this aspect of Charlie's content was seemingly what made her so popular. The fact that other teenagers and young people on the app could watch her content and relate to her. Charlie also talked about in interviews how she kept a vision board in her room with photos of Jennifer Lopez, who she wanted to dance with since she was 12 years old. In July of 2019, on her way to dance class, Charlie posted a side-by-side -side or duet TikTok of her following the choreography of another TikTok user named Move With Joy. 
Want to do a dance challenge but don't want to spend the next week of your life learning intricate choreography? I made this for you. Here we go. Step, step, flip, flip, shoulder, shoulder, hip, hip. Hands go up, hands go down. Move your booty all around. When Charlie posted the video, she only had seven followers at the time. The video picked up in the algorithm while Charlie was at dance class. And when she checked her phone after class, all of a sudden she had 2,000 followers. And things got pretty interesting from there. Welcome to the group. Fashion Week, Europe, Milan, Japan, Kids Choice Award. Let me ask you, Charlie, you once wrote about yourself, don't worry, I don't get the hype either. <laughs> you have over 150 million followers. Do you get the hype yet? I mean, no. Hi, nice to meet you. You said you're a child? Hm, not anymore. Now you're a brand. Her mom, Heidi, remembers weeks of Charlie waking up to hundreds of thousands of followers a day. So when, when you see this going on, and you can obviously recognize like there's some, some massive attention going, do you, do you immediately say like, okay, like we gotta start thinking about how this is gonna affect her life? Or do you, or you kind of like, let's just see how this plays out? Well, I mean, Mark and I are pretty savvy with social media and using it as business and, and, and how to grow. And so we recognize that this shift is major and it's happening. And so, you know, what happened was people were starting to reach out. They wanted to manage her, this and that. Most of Charlie's content features her dancing to trending songs. And as her dancing videos gained traction, she quickly amassed hundreds of thousands to millions of followers. This wasn't something that I was asking for, or looking for. A lot of my journey was everyone telling me that I didn't deserve it. Why am I where I am? I don't do anything special. I'm not different than anyone. There's millions of people that would probably be better at my job than I am, but somehow it's me. The best explanation for Charlie's virality could have possibly been her youth appeal and her relatability. TikTok classified more than a third of its user base in the United States as under 14 years old, meaning there's a massive amount of users on TikTok who are children. And who do children want to follow? Other children. Just like in the Disney era, children wanted to look up to Disney stars. You know, or I guess, what did you think it was about Charlie's videos that, you know, was so appealing to people. Why do you think people started freaking out? Yeah, I, I think just the fact that she let people into a normal teenager's life in her bedroom. I say it all the time. One of the first things we would say is, don't you want to make your bed or clean up a little bit? And she was just like, no, dad, this is what everybody wants. In October of 2019, Charlie gained even more exposure and internet virality after performing a dance called The Renegade, the K-Camp song Lottery. The videos where Charlie would perform Renegade blew up massively, so much so that a lot of people incorrectly credited Charlie as the one that created the Renegade dance. For months. Charlie posted videos performing Renegade with friends and fellow content creators like David Dobrik. Charlie quickly after created other social media platforms outside of TikTok like on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. For the first couple of months, Charlie's YouTube channel was really successful and racked in millions of views. Hey guys, it's Charlie and I'm super excited to be sharing with you my first ever YouTube video on my YouTube channel. Hell. <laughs> Just kidding. Hey guys, it's Charlie and I'm super excited to be starting off my YouTube channel with my first ever YouTube video about my meet and greet tomorrow. The children were loving Charlie D'Amelio. Around this time, Dixie D'Amelio, Charlie's only and older sister, having witnessed her younger sister's internet stardom, joined TikTok and began posting regularly. Though Charlie grew up dancing, Dixie did not share the same passion. Dixie did competitive BMX racing and track and field. Did you know that Dixie was a sick BMX biker ranking fifth in the nation? <laughs> 
as well as performed in shows like The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and Cinderella. Initially, Dixie thought that TikTok seemed embarrassing. I used to think TikTok was the most embarrassing thing in the world. However, as Dixie's younger sister became massively famous on the platform, her perspective on the app began to change. Every conversation was about TikTok. Oh my god, Charlie has 100,000 followers. Oh my god, she has 200,000. I said, I'm done. If Charlie hits 1 million followers, I'll start posting because I'm done being left out like this. My sister started posting. I was like, you are so embarrassing. Like, what are you doing? I don't know how Charlie blew up. It's crazy. I mean, we think about it all the time. I'm like, Charlie? Charlie D'Amelio. Dixie really would just primarily post casual videos of herself because whenever Dixie would try to dance in a video, viewers would point out the difference between her sister's dancing abilities and hers, which she didn't grow up as a dancer. So of course she wouldn't be as skilled as her sister. Something that I personally find to be very strange about the story of the D'Amelio family is that shortly after Charlie D'Amelio and her sister Dixie started to become famous through TikTok, her parents decided to join them and create TikTok accounts. Charlie and Dixie's parents, Mark and Heidi D'Amelio, created their own separate TikTok accounts that only garner attention because of their daughter's internet fame. Their parents have been featured in their daughter's content and tagged, virtually creating social media brands off of their daughter's fame. And I just find that a little bit weird. Is it just me? Just personally, can never imagine my parents or any of my friends' parents that I know creating social media accounts off of their children's success and advertising themselves. It's just interesting, you know? It's been so cool for people to find communities for such niche things that they didn't even know existed. So like, even from like my TikTok to my mom's TikTok or Charlie's or my dad's, it's all different from what we see. This is where Mark D'Amelio, Marky Mark, becomes a very interesting character in the story of Charlie and Dixie D'Amelio. Dixie claims that their father Mark has drilled into the two daughters to always be focused on building a brand from a young age. The biggest thing our dad would say to us is to protect your brand and how are you going to grow that? I think this started from our childhood, the biggest thing our dad would say to us is protect your brand, protect your brand. And like, my dad was just always really good at kind of looking at long term and setting us up for life instead of just like, make as much money as you can with your 15, like, seconds of fame. I understand a dad wanting to teach their children business, but to drill into somebody from their childhood to be focused on their brand and their future and building a brand constantly, interesting. So from the very beginning that Charlie and Dixie became popular on TikTok, their father, Mark, has been extremely involved in building their influencer brands. About well, that, yeah. but I've been involved with brands and I have a lot of friends that do licensing so i picked up the phone and called and said is this a business yet like yeah and early on we had people record companies and record executives getting in touch with charlie directly and heidi tells a story that Dick, charlie came and said to heidi hey this guy wants to give me a hundred dollars to do uh, a dance to his <laughs> song on TikTok. And yeah. Like, yeah. And I was like, that's not real. Let me and <laughs> it I talked to him and, it, and it happened. So it started off with just these small little deals and it has escalated in something massive. And the parents, Mark and Heidi, have been involved in building their own brands as well off of their daughter's success. You are the queen of TikTok. Like y'all are the reigning first family, I feel like, of social media. Mark D'Amelio has over 10 million followers on TikTok. And he posts a lot of random day-to-day -day moments online, as well as throwback content of Charlie and Dixie when they were younger.
The mom, Heidi, also has over 10 million followers and seemingly tries to post a lot of advice videos for moms as well as glamorous vlogs of her lifestyle now that they're rich and famous from their daughter's fame. And by November of 2019, the D'Amelio brand was growing fast. Carly D'Amelio had over 5 million followers and Dixie had almost reached 1 million. The sisters started to collaborate with other TikTok influencers and traveling to LA. So this quickly became a full-time job for them when they were only teenagers, even though they still remained mostly based in their home state, Connecticut. Around this time, influencer Chase Hudson and YouTuber Thomas Petro were brainstorming the idea of a content house where people could all live in the house and create content together. This eventually became known as the infamous Hype House. Harley and Dixie D'Amelio would appear in some of the Hype House content and were considered some of the most popular members of this collaboration group club something like that there are a lot of huge tiktokers in the hype house right like isn't like charlie d'amelio dixie d'amelio addison ray aren't they all in the hype house while the hype house was branded as just a bunch of popular friends making content together in reality it was a business a bad business that failed like most things that influencers seem to do and that the d'amelios ultimately decided that they were better off without probably realizing that the hype house needed them more than they needed it i guess i haven't been keeping up with all of the latest news on the hype house but i didn't realize that like everybody who is really popular has already left the hype house which is to be kind of expected with content houses. I mean, that's kind of how it goes, right? They get really popular, everyone in it gets really popular and then realizes, wait, I don't need to live in a house with like 16 other people. And so they get their own house. The Hype House started as a place for a new group of TikTok creators who became friends to create content together. A representative for Charlie D'Amelio said when they ultimately decided to leave the house, stop being associated with it, Charlie and Dixie were a part of the group and they created content with their friends at the house when they were visiting LA from Connecticut. When the Hype House started to become more of a business, they stepped away from that aspect, but haven't stepped away from being friends with the members in the house. Shortly after unhyping themselves, the sisters moved to their very own $5.5 million LA mansion. Also, this is only what, less than a year? into Charlie and Dixie's social media fame and they're buying a $5 million mansion? Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. If you happen to find yourself becoming famous online overnight, please save your money. Do not be buying mansions right away. At the very end of 2019, Charlie signed with the management company Outshine Talent before the D'Amelio family collectively signed with United Talent Agency. United Talent Agency is one of the biggest talent agencies. They work with social media stars like Alex Earl and Emma Chamberlain and have also signed a ton of high profile movie stars. At the time, by the end of 2019, Charlie D'Amelio's TikTok had grown to nearly 18 million followers and she was gaining around 200,000 followers a day. Dixie had over 6 million followers, Mark had 1.5 million, and Heidi had 600,000. So the entire family signed with the talent agency, not just the daughters who were the ones that were really blowing up or receiving most of the social media attention. Nope, everyone signed with the talent agency. That's awesome. When you signed with UTA, you did like the whole family package. Like we're, you're taking out one of us, you're yeah. taking all of us. Imagine you get social media famous completely unexpectedly and you get an offer to sign with a famous agency. Your parents are like, what about us? Us. So what are some of like the components that went into deciding UTAs for us? So I think, first of all, Charlie was 15. Mm -hmm. So there was no way we were going to let her come to LA by herself. So we were coming <laughs> as, a, as a family. And what was interesting about UTA is they started to dive into my wife's numbers and my numbers and, and Dixie's numbers. They're the ones that said, hey, we think your family has something. Mm -hmm. Heidi's growth, although Charlie is exploding, Heidi's growth on Instagram is incredible. Dixie is someone that we think could, could be big and started to ask about what our interests were. Talent agencies can also at times provide input on how to handle different public relations crises 
communities if they have experience in navigating controversy and negative publicity, which Charlie needed just weeks after the management deal was signed. When the New York Times published an article revealing the actual creator of the renegade, the article suggested that Charlie and other TikTok creators emulated the dance without crediting the source. The renegade was created by 14-year-old choreographer Jalea Harmon, who designed the dance in September of 2019, a month before Charlie recreated it on TikTok. I posted on Instagram and it got about 13,000 views and people started doing it over and over again, Jalea said. By October of 2019, the dance had spread to TikTok and was going viral. The only problem was no one was crediting Jalea as the one who created the dance. Jalea tried contacting the creators who were performing her dance and gaining millions and millions of views from it, asking them to credit her. She was ridiculed or ignored for the most part. I was happy when I saw my dance all over, but I wanted credit for it. Jalea is also a young black girl, only 14 years old, creating this dance that became so popular, which is really impressive. And yet the dance was stolen from her and recreated by a ton of white teenage girls on TikTok with millions of followers already. They were able to take that choreography and profit immensely from the dance. Charlie, through a publicist, said that she was so glad to know who created the dance. I know it's associated with me, but I'm so happy to give Jalea credit. And shortly after the New York Times article was published, Charlie posted a video performing the renegade alongside Jalea and Addison Rae, with Jalea at the forefront, seemingly putting the controversy behind them. Even if this was just to save face, it was still great that the original choreographer was credited. And soon after, Charlie's first big controversy was overshadowed by a global pandemic, which very quickly shifted people's attention. Before we continue in the D'Amelio story, with the family catapulting into mainstream at the start of 2020, here's a brief intermission with the last sponsorship in this video. Summer is right around the corner and lately I've been going to the gym more, going on hikes and traveling. And I tend to do all of these activities while listening to either music, audiobooks, or podcasts. The thing is, usually it's hard to find a good earbud that not only fits my ear comfortably, but stays on throughout all my activity and has good audio quality. When you want to tune into something great to motivate you throughout your day, sometimes you've got to tune out the noise around you. That's why I want to tell you how Raycon's everyday earbuds just got even better. Their new upgraded model now features active noise cancellation. Raycon has the same audio quality that you can expect from the big guys, but at half the price. If you haven't bought from Raycon before, or if you're in the market for another pair, either for yourself, a friend, or a partner, because they're that good, now is the time to check them out. Because Raycon just launched their upgraded model of their best-selling everyday earbuds. The upgraded everyday earbuds offer everything you love about Raycons and some more. Because now you also get active noise cancellation, ergonomic design, and multi-point connectivity that lets you pair with multiple devices at once. Available in a variety of new and vibrant colors to complement any and all skin tones. Raycon has an ergonomic earbud shape to fit the widest range of ears, which I love because apparently I have the weirdest shaped ears and usually earbuds do not fit me well and constantly fall out. I find the Raycon earbuds to be very comfortable and stay in no matter what hike or workout I'm doing. Raycon earbuds also have three customizable sound styles, which I think is amazing for those who have sound preferences or sensitive ears. The earbuds are also weatherproof and sweat resistant, which I really appreciate as someone who lives in a state where the weather is constantly changing. If you've been waiting to check out Raycon, with the new model in the upcoming summer season, now is the perfect time. Their upgraded model will blow you away. Click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash CWHM 
to get 15% off your purchase plus free shipping. Thank you so much to Raycon for sponsoring this video and I hope everyone who checks them out enjoys Raycon earbuds as much as I have been. Sponsorships allow the channel to put in the time and effort to continue growing our craft and creating as quality content as possible. Now let's get back to discussing the D'Amelio family at the start of 2020 when the pandemic began and the entire family was newly experiencing fame. Carly, her family, and other TikTok influencers took advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic in a way that could probably never be recreated again. The pandemic brought a lot of stress, uncertainty, and boredom for many people. So around this time, a lot of people turned to TikTok for quick entertainment to help them forget about their worries. This helped the D'Amelio family, who was already becoming very popular on the platform, grow even more in the year 2020. Social media for a brief time replaced a lot of other forms of entertainment for people, it seemed. And the D'Amelios were at the forefront of this. Right place, right time. For them, not anyone else. Because of this, a lot of brands started looking to them to do collaborations, especially since they had their agency to help them set up the deal. Through the pandemic, Charlie and other influencers did a Super Bowl commercial for Sabra Hummus. Mm. Mm. Okay, Boomer. And in that same month, the D'Amelio sisters and Addison Rae were invited to the 2020 NBA All-Star Weekend in Chicago. So what's it like for you here in Chicago so far? Well, it's really different this time around. A lot closer to the corner. So in 2020, the shift began to happen where multi-billion dollar companies like the NFL and the NBA were starting to use TikTokers to promote their brand. And these TikTok influencers spent the All-Star Weekend doing viral TikTok dances with NBA players and posting it on their pages. In early March of 2020, exactly a year since Charlie initially blew up. Jimmy Fallon invited Charlie onto The Tonight Show. So she went from gaining 2,000 followers in March of 2019 to going on The Tonight Show in March of 2020. And on the segment with Jimmy Fallon, Charlie taught him how to do popular TikTok dances. <laughs> This segment has since garnered over 23 million views on YouTube and sits among The Tonight Show's most popular videos. Jimmy Fallon has featured people and interviewed people who've been in their industry for 15 years, 20 years, have so much wisdom and knowledge to share. And yet there's this teenager who's been doing TikTok dances online for a year. That becomes one of the most viewed clips from his show. Because Charlie had the ability to produce those kinds of views and numbers and popularity. She was being approached by multi-billion dollar corporations to be the face of their products. And she should have still been in high school. In April of 2020, the D'Amelio family appeared on a Nickelodeon special called Kids Together, the Nickelodeon Town Hall, which was hosted by Kristen Bell. Carly, everyone is going crazy over this distance dance that you created. You have a huge TikTok following, and I was wondering if you would teach me how to do the distance dance. I have been limbering up so that we can stand. Let's do it. Ready? Ready. <laughs> I think I nailed it. The D'Amelio family, all together, again, also appeared on an ABC television special, the Disney Family Sing Along. Charlie continued to collaborate with a ton of different brands. She even appeared in her idol, Jennifer Lopez's music video. As well as BB Rexa's. Baby! 
Charlie capped off 2020 with an award for Breakout Creator at the 10th Streamy Awards. This year's Breakout Creator of the Year is... Uh... Are you serious? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you for my parents for letting me do this, letting me move to LA, being there for me every step of the way. I'm wishing you for all of them, my team, just Really, this is insane. And published a book. The amount of things that this teenager did in the year 2020, a pandemic when most of us did nothing, let's be real. She also published a book titled Essentially Charlie, The Ultimate Guide to Keeping It Real. She talked about identity, cyberbullying, social media, and body image, as well as Charlie's childhood and family life. And Essentially Charlie went on to become a New York Times bestseller. What a, what a year for you. Um, and now to be a published author, I feel like um, you have had so many irons in the fire. Are you exhausted? It's obviously a lot with everything that I'm working on. Which is something a lot of authors work really hard to do. But looking back in hindsight, amount of appearances, talk shows, brand deals, marketing efforts that Charlie did in the year 2020, her first full year of being TikTok mega famous, it's a little concerning how much was crammed in there. It makes me wonder how much her parents were really looking out for her versus how much they were pushing her to do all of this, especially considering they involved themselves in Charlie's social media brand from the very beginning and signed with a talent agency alongside with her and did appearances on Nickelodeon and Disney with their daughters. I spent like 15, 16, 17, 18 those very important years where you make the friends and you're going to college and yeah. you're in high school, all that stuff, surrounded by a bunch of adults. Yeah. Or especially in the beginning, people who wanted to make videos together, but then I was never invited to actually hang out. So with all that being said, it makes me wonder, what is the background of the D'Amelio family? Where did they come from, especially Mark and Heidi? You had uh, photos like this with the family before? Maybe He's Hollywood now. <laughs> First celebrity friend right here. <laughs> Mark and Heidi D'Amelio crossed paths at a New York City gym in 1997. At the time, Mark was a salesman for a sportswear company, and Heidi was a personal trainer and model. Mark D'Amelio also has a bachelor's in political science and government from the University of Connecticut, and according to Mark's LinkedIn, he spent most of his career in the apparel industry. Been in the clothing business my entire career, have my own clothing brand, and working for, uh, bringing other clothing brands to retail. Mark founded Mad Soul Clothing Company in the year 2000 and left the company in the year 2007 to start Level 4 Collective Showroom, where he continues to be a part of the leadership team. The website for Level 4 Collective reads, Level 4 Collective bridges the gap between brands and buyers. Mark loves tech and okay. like social media and how to, he's in sales and okay. he always has been and he's always worked for himself. He's an entrepreneur. And so he always used that. So he just saw the value in social media. The other hand, in the 90s, Heidi left her home in Louisiana to pursue modeling in New York City. I just, on, I moved on my birthday to New York City. Oh. And and then I met Mark like Aww. later that year. And then her and Mark crossed paths in 1997. A, a gym, I was a personal trainer. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the guy that ran my gym, when he and Mark were in college, they were roommates. Which she described as the year that she not only started to fall in love with Mark, but started to fall in love with herself. Hey. Yeah, Mark was the one. I knew instantly. And the pair got married a few years later in the year 2000. By 2000, the couple moved to Norwalk, Connecticut after Heidi became pregnant with their first child, Dixie, who was born in 2001. Charlie was born a few years later in 2004. So after we got married, rent was really high. <laughs> it was like at the height of the market. Yeah, yeah. So we're like, and I wanted to have kids. I'm like, I can't do it in right, New York City. Right. Did you guys want kids right away after you got married? We were kind 
kind of just chilling and I got pregnant right away. After building their family, Mark started to take a lot of leadership roles within their community in Connecticut. He held leadership roles in the Norwalk High School Parents Club and Parent Teacher Organization. That's right, Mark was a PTO leader. Despite the sunshine and rainbows, happy-go-lucky family image that the D'Amelios try to sell to the public, the D'Amelios are not without their skeletons in the closet, particularly Marky Mark. Mark D'Amelio wasn't always the spotless family man who helped out with his daughter's schools, as the public was led to believe. In 2014, Mark D'Amelio was arrested for a DUI, and the details surrounding this arrest are very strange. The worst fact of all the details surrounding Mark's arrest is that when he was caught driving drunk, his daughter Charlie was in the car with him and she was only nine years old at the time. Not only that, but he also had three total strangers with him in the car at the time of the arrest who he had claimed to pick up at a bodega, and he also claimed that he had picked them up in order to give his casino winnings to them to teach his daughter a lesson about charity. Then in 2018, Mark decided to run for election for the Connecticut State Senate, to represent District 25 as a Republican candidate. In a statement on his campaign website, Mark said, When elected, I will stand up to Democrats, Republicans, and the president if I disagree with policies that are not the best interest of the majority of the people I represent. Mark did not win the election. Mark and Heidi enrolled Charlie and Dixie in the King School in Stamford, Connecticut, which was known for sending graduates to top 50 colleges and has a $50,000 tuition, that's $100,000 a year, for both daughters to go to school. Every time I cover this, where these people are sending their children to private schools, I'm mind boggled every time at the amount of money these parents are spending on private schools. $100,000 a year to send both of their children to this private school. So already it's clear that Charlie and Dixie lived a fairly privileged and fairly out of touch life. So when Charlie says that her life before becoming TikTok famous was very normal, like every other teenager's life. I mean, our lives were very, very normal. Yeah. Um, I was getting ready to go to college. Charlie and I were in school together, just like hanging out every weekend. A big part of me doubts that. I think what was so desirable maybe about the Charlie D'Amelio brand is that it was a sort of clean and simple life that a lot of teenagers wanted to have, where there wasn't a lot of complications, troubles, poverty, parents fighting or parental issues. She had stable parents a comfortable home, cute put together outfits, all of these things that a lot of teenagers long to have, a good friend network. It sounds very simple, but that aspect was relatable enough and yet something that a lot of teenagers longed for. Problem is, I wonder if the D'Amelios ever really realized that because in my opinion, if they did, they would have just stayed living that kind of very normal, comfortable lifestyle, showcasing to teenagers a sort of elegant elevated, perfect teen life. But instead, Marky Mark had his children doing all sorts of business moves. The children were working too fast to keep up with their growing social media fame and all the demands coming at them from major brands and people who wanted to work with them because of this fame. And they started to make decisions that didn't make sense. Quickly, the D'Amelios were moving away from this sort of perfect teenager life to this celebrity living a lavish life that most teenager will never understand or relate to. So the decisions just started to not work for their brand and what the audience was interested in. In May of 2020, the Demilo sisters created a podcast called Two Chicks. I actually was invited. No, you were. No, I wasn't. No, you were. No, I was not. I had something that day. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. What? You had nothing. I was like really, really busy. Mm-hmm. With what? Um, 
I had lots of stuff to do. Mm. It's confidential. Weird. First off, podcasts is one of the hardest genres to make interesting and make work. You have to be one of the most interesting people in the world to make a successful podcast because it's just you talking into a mic for hours and hours. And who wants to listen to multiple hours of someone talking into a mic? He said, yeah, we know. I, <laughs> I know. Because you talked about it for the past 20 minutes. Anyways, podcasts are one of the most challenging forms of media to make work. It can only work if you're super interesting and engaging as a person and have a lot of things to say. If you're a certified yapper, if you can yap about anything and everything, yap off the bat, yap on the riff, and are Charlie and Dixie, those people, I'm just gonna come out and say it? No, they're not. But that's okay. It's okay to not have a lot to say to where you can fill up hours and hours. Oh my gosh, get down from there. Absolute deviant. Even more horrifyingly, Rick and Heidi D'Amelio also started their own podcast. You and Heidi got a podcast, the other D'Amelios. What was the, the basis of you guys beginning that podcast and what's been the feedback uh, from the fans and, and from your girls? So I, I, I think for, let's start with the girls. I don't know that they've heard an episode. Another thing Heidi and I did just to give the people out there that may care our perspective on kind of the behind the scenes of what happens to Dixie and Charlie. Because if you finish listening to all the hours and hours of Charlie and Dixie podcast content, then just you can hop on over and listen to their parents talk for hours and hours. I would be nicer to their parents if they built their own legitimate brand off of their own things that they were doing, but you were literally building a brand off of your daughters. People give a lot of famous TikTokers who are, for the most part, children and teenagers a hard time for becoming famous for doing nothing, having no talent. But what I would say is the definition of becoming famous for having no talent is Mark and Heidi D'Amelio. Ari, get your own thing. Instead of mom or dad, get out of my room. Get the it's literally, mom, dad, get out of my career. Mom, dad, get out of my brand. It's strange being popular because of your kids. To bring up kids that have become so successful that they now have shed light on you. I don't know if this is a revolutionary idea, but not every famous influencer needs a podcast. You know, there's that saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. If you don't have anything to say, don't make a podcast. Somehow that lesson has been lost on a lot of people. Talk about how much money you spent on Legos. That's none of your beeswax. What personally. was your most expensive Lego set? It was like $220. Yeah. Ultimately, it seems like social media advice is similar to a lot of dating advice out there. You have to maintain the level of mystery. If you're too available, too accessible, and, well, shoving things in people's faces a lot, no one is going to like you. Content creators on all platforms, no matter what content you post, push to produce as much content as possible. The social media platforms themselves reward more consistent posting, and the audience is usually more happy to see their favorite creators posting more content. But if you're posting just to keep your numbers up, eventually the quality of what you're creating is going to go down. I guess it's what people call being a sellout. And this is something that started to happen with the D'Amelios. There was just too much content happening. Their audience was being bombarded with information, new appearances, new collaborations, sponsorships, platforms, creations of theirs. It was a lot to keep up with. The podcast is just one example of this. So many hours of content now available featuring Charlie and Dixie. And was any of it quality? It's up for you to decide. So unfortunately, as time went on, the D'Amelio's views, engagement, and interactions started to decline, despite Charlie and Dixie being more active than ever. In 2020, Dixie also tried her own thing at things. Um, she tried to branch off of 
TikTok. Her sister had dancing and she hadn't quite found her space yet. And I think she wanted to differentiate herself from her sister. So she tried her hand at acting, made her acting debut in the TV series Attaway General. Some of you may recognize the actress who plays the main character as being that one girl from TikTok. Or some of you may know her as being the sister of that one girl from TikTok. And I love her character. There's so much variety in the way she rolls her eyes. Sometimes she does it while she's talking, sometimes she does it while someone else is talking. The first season of Attaway General is about a hospital's prestigious volunteer program where teenagers get to work on patients in this volunteer program at the hospital. Oh, jeez. <laughs> as well as, I guess, other things that teenagers supposedly do while working in a hospital, which teenagers also totally do. What are you doing? Oh. Don't come any closer. I don't think that's gonna hurt anyone. Very realistic and appropriate show for children. Rat TV co-founder talks about Attaway General by saying, too often Gen Z audiences have to choose between the talent they follow and the shows they stream. So instead, why not offer something that's talentless and also not a show at all? So Attaway General basically took a lot of TikTok stars and put them into a Grey's Anatomy style plotline that doesn't have much of a plotline for teenagers and kids to watch. But instead of there being, I don't know, important lessons for children or even just important health information for children and teenagers, that would be worth the watch and important. The way general is instead just filled with bad acting scenes and a ton of very unrealistic scenarios where these teenagers have to assist people in critical health conditions despite having zero qualifications. Me? Hello? Hey, excuse me? Uh, hello? Hey. Sorry, but it's really busy right now. There's been a huge accident. I know, I was in it. They're also just working around the hospital, in and out of patient rooms, and then breaking into TikTok dances in the hallway. Moving too fast. <laughs> no, ooh, more energy. The show received terrible reviews, sitting at a 1 out of 10 on IMDb. And Dixie D'Amelio left the show after one season to focus on her music career. Dixie, in particular, got a lot of heat on the show for being one of the weaker actors, despite her speaking often about having a background in theater. After noticing how difficult live action acting was for her older sister, Charlie ended up doing a voice acting role instead. In the children's animated film Star Dog and Turbo Cat in June of 2020. In July of 2020. 2020 is still going on. They're still doing things in 2020. This is exhausting me thinking about how many things they did. But in July of 2020, the D'Amelio sisters partnered with Morphe Cosmetics to launch a makeup collaboration. While Dixie and Charlie's fan base consists of mainly young girls, so creating a makeup line seems like a smart business move, her sister is really known for their makeup skills or even wearing a lot of makeup in the first place. Charlie became popular for dancing and Dixie became popular through being known from her younger sister. With Morphe, we're working together to show that you are beautiful with or without makeup. I want people to wear as little or as much as they want and feel confident. Charlie's even talking about not having to wear makeup in her Morphe collab, which I mean, I, I agree with the statement, but it feels like she's like, I mean, you don't got to wear, you don't have to wear makeup if you don't want to. You really sold me on this makeup product. Thing is, by the summer of 2020, there was a whole beauty niche and community developing on TikTok at the time. So a lot of the young teens that were following Charlie and Dixie were getting their beauty and makeup content from other influencers at that point who are more known for the beauty and makeup space. 
but also more importantly, more passionate about it. It was just kind of clear from the way that Charlie and Dixie marketed their Morphe collab that there was really no passion behind it whatsoever. It's unclear how successful the D'Amelio's collaboration with Morphe Cosmetics was, but considering that Morphe never worked with the D'Amelio's again, presumably it wasn't that successful. In June of 2020, Dixie was also turning her passion for singing into another career avenue and released her first debut single titled Be Happy, which was supposed to focus on themes like mental illness and depression. Be Happy was followed by a music video that's garnered over 100 million views since its initial upload. While I do not want to discredit Dixie's struggles with her mental health, I do want to point out that there is a strange dichotomy of the music video itself for Be Happy as Dixie's literally sitting in this $5.5 million mansion in the music video that they just got off of their social media success and fame and complaining about how she's not happy. Of course, there's that lesson of money can't buy happiness, but it does buy comfort and it buys a lot of privileges that people that don't have money can't afford, like healthcare, like a roof over their head, like a $5 million mansion that could pay for so many people's entire existence. And so it, it just feels very tone deaf to be filming this music video talking about how unhappy she is in a $5 million mansion. It's just the tone deafness of the music video that's fascinating. This is sort of where you can start to see the beginning of this pattern that the D'Amelios would do where they would complain a lot very publicly when they were afforded so much by their overnight success. And of course they were doing so much so quickly, moving very fast, had a lot of pressure. But from an audience's perspective, when you're following someone and you just start to see them constantly complaining about their life when you also see that they have it so much better than you have it that becomes really draining for an audience or for a viewer just in general no one wants to follow someone and listen to them complain constantly because we all literally have it rough out here a lot of people watch content to escape their problems and their struggles something that is important to note for why a lot of celebrities famous people very rich and wealthy people are so unhappy is is the phenomenon called the hedonic treadmill, which is basically this idea that no matter where we are in life, we maintain a certain level of happiness or adjust to that level of reality around us and therefore can more easily, I guess, hyperfixate on all the things wrong in our life or all the reasons we're unhappy. New level of fame or success becomes the new normal for that person. So their baseline level of happiness just sort of catches up to them wherever they are in life, no matter how much success they achieve, like a constant treadmill where you're running to achieve something, yet each milestone that you achieve, you're still just as unhappy as you always were. It's where you just feel like nothing and no positive feelings towards yourself that like everything could be going perfectly and I'm just miserable yeah. and it's so frustrating like I'm ruining all these good times. That being said, Dixie's song still was a way for her to try and start a music career and also separate her brand identity from her sisters. And it started a conversation of TikTok as an app helping to aid hiring musicians and those in the music industry. In the first verse, Dixie claims that her friends are calling, but she ain't really trying to go out. No, that didn't stop her from going on holiday to the Bahamas during a massive COVID peak in December, but I digress. In the pre-chorus, she has chips on her shoulders, apparently. Not sure if that's quite the idiom you're thinking of there. From what I remember, it's having a chip on your shoulder not a large fries with a side of I get her I get her pain bro I get what she's what she's talking about bro now I don't know if this is just a song or if this is how she really be like how she really be feeling um but I relate to it bro I be talking about that shit all the time bro like sometimes don't be happy like sometimes don't be happy they gotta throw that shit on they gotta you know throw a smile on just so they can get through the day and, and so and stop fucking asking them are you okay What's wrong? You want to talk about? No, I don't want to talk. About leave, leave me alone, bro. Damn. You don't even care, bro. You just asking because you see me sad. I actually like the song. It's a good song, bro. She's talking about some real.
The song also came out during a time when the sisters were super popular, so Dixie's fan base did show a lot of support for Be Happy, which charted in multiple countries and was certified gold. But unfortunately, the song Be Happy, very first song that Dixie put out, would ultimately be the peak of Dixie's music career. Following the success of her debut single, Dixie signed a record deal with record executive L.A. Reid's label Hitco Entertainment. For the rest of 2020, Dixie released more singles like Naughty List, a Christmas song featuring Liam Payne, One Whole Day with Wiz Khalifa, and Roommates. Each of these singles received less than favorable reviews and failed to chart in the U.S. Write music. So what does mm-hmm. a song writing process for you look like? I walk into a room with like a writer and a producer and basically just start talking yeah. and I'm like, oh my god, this boy did this to me and I'm pissed. Or I did this to someone and I feel like an asshole, but I need to like fix it. Just kind of anything. I just talk and talk until like someone connects with something and then we'll go deep into a song and just... Despite the fact that Dixie was improving as a singer, she just couldn't shake the stigma of being a TikTok artist or that cringy girl from TikTok. You may recognize the actress who plays the main character as being that one girl from TikTok, or some of you may know her as being the sister of that one girl from TikTok. Trailer, and it got a lot of hate. I was very frustrated because I worked so hard and it wasn't even the song. It seemed that people just weren't willing to give Dixie's music a chance compared to someone who took more of a traditional route. Or conversely, a lot of people that take more of a traditional route in music, when they put out their first songs, they're not as well known. So there's more room to be cringy. There's more room to make mistakes. But Dixie put out music when she was massively famous already. So she had to either put out music that was perfect or have a bad reputation of putting out a bad song. So it seems like in 2020, the D'Amelios were making a ton of business deals, going extremely fast, extremely furious. (laughs) Yet a lot of the decisions that they were making in business, in their brand, in their career, which was kind of thrust onto them as teenagers, which I don't think anyone can be prepared for, really good decisions and didn't really pan out. In a way, they were sort of destroying the brand that their audience liked them so much for in the first place. But things would get even worse as from late 2020 and onward, the D'Amelios found themselves in worse and worse controversy. Maybe all of this fame and success was just coming too rapidly for the D'Amelio family, especially as fans noticed that online, Charlie's ego seemed to be inflated as time progressed. Which just brings up the question, should teenagers even really have millions of adoring fans, eyes on them, attention, critics, adults managing them, corporations offering them brand deals? What does that do to a teenager's psyche? So much intense love, but also so much intense hatred all being sent to one person. It's a lot to take in and comprehend and to not let it get to you in some way. In November of 2020, Charlie D'Amelio lost nearly 1 million followers after posting the first episode in a new series called Dinner with the D'Amelios in their joint family YouTube channel. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the D'Amelio family YouTube channel. And tonight we are starting our brand new episode of Dinner with the D'Amelios, where we invite a person. Actually, we didn't invite anyone because we have no idea who's coming. So welcome to episode one of Dinner with the D'Amelios. series was supposed to be about the D'Amelio family eating a meal with a new surprise guest each episode. In this first episode, the D'Amelios sat down with beauty influencer James Charles. They wouldn't book me for the next D'Amelio show? I thought it was going to be like someone we didn't know. Got it. And a paella dinner was prepared for them by private chef Aaron May. The dish, which is traditional to Spanish culture, contained snails. Yeah. 
no, 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 get it together. You need to be paying attention. Like you need to be looking at copy of this. You need to be understanding deal terms because a lot of people don't, but unfortunately that's what a lot of influencers what is everyone laughing at? Oh my God. The chef addresses the table saying, it's actually an omen of good luck and fortune, to which Charlie scoffs and says, liars. It's probably, uh, and it's actually uh, a, a omen of good luck and fortune. And you, Does it actually bring you good luck? Good luck and good fortune, yes. Liar. Dixie then takes a small bite of the snail before gagging and running outside. The mom says, so dramatic, excuse yourself. Oh god. So dramatic. Don't be so dramatic. Yeah. Excuse dude. yourself. Is she being real? Or is yeah. she being dramatic? Harley then asks the chef if she can have some dino nuggets instead. Ew. Classic Dixie. Do we have any dino nuggets? Ew. Don't let the dogs. Oh, God. Later in the video, Charlie talks about really wanting to hit 100 million followers because she wants to hit 100 million a year after she hits a million followers. Wait, whoa, 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 in whoa. One year. If we're thinking about it, okay, how far away? That's Friday, okay. Ugh, I wish it, I wish I had like more time. Because imagine if I hit 100 mil a year after hitting a mil. Was the 95 not enough for you? <laughs> well, I was just like saying like even numbers. Well, right. all right guys, thank you so much for watching um, our YouTube video. Thank you so much for uh, being no. here. We're so happy that we have you guys as part of our family. Charlie hit 1 million followers on TikTok in September of 2019 and almost reached 100 million exactly one year later. James Charles replied, is 95 million followers not enough for you? I don't know if I hit a hundred mil a year after hitting a mil. Because that's how many followers on TikTok Charlie had at the time. For the first time, instead of viewing Charlie as a girl next door, relatable archetype, social media viewed the D'Amelio sisters as sort of rich and entitled brats who acted rude and unprofessionally. Charlie and Dixie are teenagers. And while there are a good amount of adventurous teenagers who enjoy cultured cuisine, how many of you know American teenagers? teenagers who would have tried snails on camera and not reacted the way that Charlie or Dixie D'Amelio reacted. Though, of course, it was blatantly wrong for the D'Amelios to disrespect another culture so dramatically and then right after go on to complain about not having enough followers. It comes across as very privileged and very out of touch. The whole thing could have been filmed and portrayed in a much better way. But because Charlie D'Amelio was portrayed and viewed unfavorably, the internet was very eager to sort of punish Charlie for it by taking away her following. Because this dinner with the D'Amelios video received so much backlash, both sisters posted their own apologies. Dixie posted a TikTok saying, I'm so grateful for all of the opportunities I've had, so I would never in any way want to be taken as disrespectful. And before I even get into anything, I'm so grateful for every single person that follows me, every single person I care about, every single person I work with, every single person who works with me because I'm just so grateful of all of the opportunities I've had. So I would never in any way want to be taken as disrespectful, especially from an out of context 15 second clip. Charlie also responded to the controversy, crying on an Instagram live, questioning whether she wanted to continue on TikTok after receiving hate from people. Like that's not okay. You can hate on me for whatever I've done, but the fact that all of this is happening because I a misunderstanding, like I just feel like that's not okay. And if this is the community that I'm in and the community that I put myself in, I don't know if I want to do that anymore. Though both sisters received a lot of backlash and a lot of hate for the controversy, they also garnered a lot of publicity for it as well. Though Charlie initially lost nearly 1 million followers from the controversy, she quickly regained them and soon became the first person on TikTok to pass 100 million followers. Though this surge in followers caused people to question the numbers behind 
behind the D'Amelio following. A lot of people throughout the D'Amelio's time on social media have questioned the numbers behind their following, feeling like a lot of it just doesn't add up and doesn't make sense, which Charlie has responded to saying, have I ever bought followers for myself or anyone? No, I have not. Has my family? No, they have not. Has anyone that I know? No, they have not. Charlie did admit that she probably does have bots, but that everyone on TikTok has bots and she can't control that. I have no power. I do not work at TikTok. My father does not work at TikTok either. I know a lot of people think that. He does not. Moral of this story, I do not buy followers. End of 2020 rounded out with the D'Amelios facing even more controversy for traveling to the Bahamas during the pandemic, while cases in the US were surging substantially. So in public statements, Mark D'Amelio tried to deflect all the blame from his children, specifically Charlie, saying that since she was underage, she had no choice in the matter since it was a family vacation. First of all, to, bl like, to blame Charlie, like it was a family vacation. Yes. She's 16, so she has no say yes. in where we're going. So you got, we can put it on me, but we, we did what we had yes. to do and, you know. So he's saying that he forced his children to travel during this pandemic when cases were surging? Okay. Despite some of these controversies, the following that the D'Amelios gained was still soaring higher and higher. Charlie now sat at over 100 million followers. So inevitably, more and more brands flocked to them to want to work with them. And the D'Amelios did as many partnerships as possible. Honestly, too many partnerships and sponsorships to talk about in this video. But we'll talk about some of the most important and interesting business endeavors of the D'Amelios. In 2020, Charlie made one of the most authentic and, in my opinion, the most successful D'Amelio brand partnership to date. Charlie was known early on in her days of creating TikToks for enjoying Dunkin' Donuts. So in 2020, after Charlie had given Dunkin' Donuts tons of free promotion in her TikTok videos, the brand decided to hire her as an official brand ambassador. The Dunkin' Donuts collaboration came about after a lot of free promotion. Um, <laughs> for a while, everyone thought I was getting paid, and I was not, and I just shamelessly promoted and promoted and promoted because I really wanted to work with them until they gave me the opportunity finally, and I immediately took it. Over the course of the partnership, Dunkin' Donuts released two drinks in collaboration with Charlie, including a limited time drink on their menu called the Charlie. I just picked up my Charlie drink. How crazy that this is a real thing, I'm so excited to try it. Look at that. One medium Charlie cold brew. That's my name on the receipt. What? Look at that. They even released Dunkin' Donuts and Charlie collab merch. Since then, we've come out with two of my own drinks on the menu and sold out cold brew <laughs> nationwide. And it was a really big hit for me. And that was a very nice feeling to see that all come together. But that was definitely a lot of my determination to work with Dunkin' Donuts for a very long time. The drinks were popular menu items in Dunkin' Donuts. I think that the partnership worked so well because the audience felt a certain level of authenticity there. Charlie seemed really passionate about the product, promoted it, and wanted to work with the brand and introduce the brand to her audience. She had a genuine interest and Dunkin' Donuts was using that interest that was already there instead of trying to manufacture an interest that didn't exist. Hey, it's Charlie, and I'm here at Dunkin' showing you my go-to drink, which is a cold brew with three pumps of caramel and whole milk, which you can order as the Charlie in store or on the app. Why I partnered with Dunkin' is because I can think back and remember the times that I would go with my dad and my sister to Dunkin' to get donuts when we were little, 
and stopping and decking to get coffee on our way to school. In 2021, at least things slowed down a little bit. The fast and furious nature of the D'Amelio family took at least a little bit of a break. In March of 2021, Charlie and Paravita bracelets released a range called the Charlie D'Amelio Pack. And this was a brand deal that somewhat made sense. But to collaborate with a company that made affordable jewelry seemed like a smart business move. Then in May of 2021, the D'Amelio sisters co-created and became the face of Social Tourist, which was an apparel brand under Hollister. And this was all supposed to be a multi-year partnership with Abercrombie and Fitch. Charlie, come here. When it comes to this whole life thing, the journey is the destination. That's where we come in. Their line of social tourists would be sold within the Hollister stores. The goal seeming to be using the D'Amelio influence to bring more traffic into Hollister stores. The D'Amelio sisters were able to profit and not have to do much of the back end work like having to produce the clothes themselves. And when you watch a lot of the behind the scenes footage, you can tell that Charlie and Dixie were taking a lot of directives from a lot of people around them, which makes me wonder really how much of a say they had in Social Tourist. You're gonna do the first one. Actually, we'll start with this one, but literally just you can watch tonight at 9 p.m. on my TikTok with Charlie's line. You're introducing the same line as before. Hey, it's Dixie. Hey, it's Charlie. And then want to learn more, and you're gonna point below. So you get what you want before it's gone. Her ad. Ooh, that's a good one. Dramatic. So just say so you, make sure you check yeah, out. Yeah. That's it. For get it now. Forever. <laughs> Check out or But according to a press release, the D'Amelio sisters have been involved in every aspect of Social Tourist. Hey, it's Charlie, and I'm going to style some of my favorite pieces from this last Social Tourist drop. But this is all from the new Social Tourist collection. Make sure that you guys go check it out. On top of that, their dad was also involved in Social Tourist, acting as a consultant since he had a background in the apparel industry. Oh, so, yeah. Surprise, surprise. Mark D'Amelio was also heavily involved in the Social Tourist partnership. It seemed initially like Social Tourist was a concept that could work really well with the D'Amelios. Their brand was all about being relatable and family friendly, and Hollister was known to be a family friendly brand as well. Besides the fact that at the time, Abercrombie and Fitch was fairly low in its ethics rating in manufacturing. But a year or two into the creation of social tourist, the engagement in the brand dropped drastically. Then this year, social tourist came to an end. A post on social tourist that was allegedly written by Dixie and Charlie read, Our partnership with social tourist and Hollister is coming to an end. We set out to create connection, take risks, and tell our story through an innovative, social-first fashion lens. Your love and support allowed our vision to come to life. We can't thank you enough. Enough. While the reason for the end of the partnership wasn't reported, most have assumed it's because the line was failing to sell well. And I'm assuming that Social Taurus was not selling well. So ultimately it's smart for everyone involved to shut this down. This does not align with Charlie or Dixie anymore. And I bet Hollister was losing money on these collaborations. So I think it's smart for everyone. And in the comments on social media, there are many people who who are claiming to have worked at Hollister that also say that everyone hated the social tourist line. One of the weirdest partnerships that the D'Amelios did was partnering to release their own mattress, a mattress drop. You can't sleep on this next D'Amelio endeavor. They partnered with Simmons Bedding Company to release the Harley and Dixie X Simmons mattress.
I'm betting that this partnership was a success. In a press release about this new bed collab, Charlie said, Our beds are the new offices of our generation, alluding to more kids growing up to become content creators or having online jobs, thus working from their beds. I totally don't work from my bed. <laughs> what? <laughs> I definitely do not script and plan out the videos from my bed. Beds? Who works from beds? P preposterous. The Charlie X Simmons memory foam mattress started at $499 for a twin mattress and went up to almost $700 for a king mattress. In June of 2021, Charlie worked with Invisalign to release a limited edition Invisalign case for the company's dental aligners. Another collaboration that made sense with Charlie when you look at the ages of those that follow her, most of whom are probably teenagers looking to get braces or align their teeth in some way. Then in July, she starred in a digital campaign for the snack brand Takis. <laughs> In the year 2021, it seemed like most of the business collaborations that the Demilos were making seemed in alignment with their brand and audience. A big challenge for the Demilos was figuring out how to take their newfound fame on the internet and transition it into the mainstream, especially since it seemed like the Demilios were determined to become successful as an entire family. Because of that, the D'Amelios have been compared to the Kardashians. As the Kardashians became famous as an entire family and then went on to start all of these individual brands which they gained more wealth and success from. So it seems that the D'Amelios tried to follow the Kardashian playbook. After gaining success from one of the members of their family, they all kind of gained fame off of that one sister and then then they went on to start their own reality show, probably with the goal of boosting their fame even further and giving those that followed them a sneak peek into their daily lives. The only question is, with fans already following them on social media and seeing them on a daily basis, would something like a reality show have the same effect on a famous family as it once did before the rise of social media? Also, was the D'Amelio family interesting? dramatic and likable enough to have an entire reality show based off of their daily lives. So the D'Amelios took a page from the Kardashian book and worked with Hulu to create a reality show, which they called The D'Amelio Show. Super creative title there. <laughs> and at least the Kardashians had keeping up with the Kardashians. The D'Amelios couldn't do days with the D'Amelios. D'Amelio Dynasty, Harley and Company. There's so many better possibilities there. Hey guys, we are so excited to announce that we have an original series coming to Hulu in 2021. We can't wait to share our lives with you all and show you our day to day in LA. And we can't wait for you to get to know us all better. All right, so what do you think is going to happen in this on this show? Are you like flipping <laughs> tables? <laughs> the show was supposed to give an inside look on the family life of the D'Amelios, as well as explore how they're dealing with their newfound fame. This is the discovery process. We're figuring out what you're good at. I just feel held to a very high standard. Millions of people watching your every move. That's like constant chance. The show talked about the D'Amelio's early rise on TikTok and Charlie being concerned about whether or not social media was a long term career. Yeah. It's a struggle. <laughs> I have no idea how this is going to work out in the long run. Honestly, we could move back to Connecticut and social media could like go podcast, on. fitting for my shoot the next day. I still have to do school. A year and a half ago in Connecticut that you'd have a clothing company? Definitely not. I thought I was like maxing out at merch. She wants. Right? Though slowly her mindset changed once the family became too famous and recognizable to return to their old lives. And then have to like start all over. What am I going to do? Go back to normal high school, move back to Connecticut? Like 
Yeah. Though the reality show also documented just how busy the two sisters' schedules were filled, with them either being in business meetings or honing their crafts by doing dance lessons and singing lessons. Why? Why? Why do I continue to do this? Where did you go? No! Be nervous. Some of the most interesting parts of the D'Amelio show, because there isn't too many, was when the show filmed how TikTok and fame impacted Dixie and Charlie's mental state. There were a few different segments of the two sisters scrolling through social media and reacting to how the hate comments affected them in real time. And both of the sisters also talk about not wanting to leave the house anymore. I've had a constant anxiety attack for the past four years. It's very very exhausting to do this and always wonder what's going to happen next. If I'm going to wake up and everyone's not going to like me again, Harley describes about dealing with all the social media attention she's received. Take pictures. All right, let's go. I used to have like 10 to 15 huge panic attacks a day. Like that's how bad it was. It's obviously still there. I obviously still struggle with it. There's no way to just like poof, anxiety's gone. It's very difficult to talk yourself out of anxiety. And Dixie talks about suffering from a lot of physical and mental problems due to the stress of internet attention and backlash. Anywhere from back pain, migraines, all due to anxiety. Now, I think my anxiety comes out in different ways, like physical pain. Yeah. And so I think that's what has been the hardest, especially getting like diagnosed with anxiety because I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm having awful back pain or I literally feel like I tore my ACL and like can't walk my knee hurts so bad I'm getting x-rays no idea what's wrong and wow. then finally discovering like that's anxiety I think that's always been there with and they would come out in migraines or stomach migraines or any kind of pain in one of the most intense moments on the reality show she collapses in tears after reading comments posted on a vlog that she shot for Vogue <laughs> jokes about how I have no style. I have style. I posted a video of just that 15 second clip and they're like, oh my god, she's so musty. I'm like, shut the f up! Like, stop! This <laughs> and it's like everyone else can like show emotions or like talk about things and everyone like supports them. But anytime I talk about like literal shit I've been through, it doesn't matter. And it's like, it just turns into a joke and it's like, it doesn't bother me as much, but I don't really hold on to things for that long. My emotions come and go so fast that I can be bawling my eyes out crying, and then three hours later, I'll be hanging with my friends, totally forgot about it. In another scene, while Charlie is getting ready for the Teen Choice Awards, where she's been nominated for the year's favorite female social star, she experiences a panic attack, fearing that if she doesn't win, it'll be embarrassing, but that if she does, people will say she doesn't deserve to. That's what's happening. If I don't win, people are going to make fun of me. Oh, if I do win, people are going to say I don't deserve it. And I think there's just a lot going through her head. It seems that both sisters feel like they cannot fail at anything. If something does not go perfectly, it tends to upset me. They're so afraid to fail, which is just not healthy and a disaster in the making because no one never fails. Her fault, it's not their fault that a hundred million people decided to make them the most famous family on TikTok. It's not Dixie's fault that she's now so popular that every single thing she does will be endlessly scrutinized. And that's where she's in sort of an impossible situation. With anything in life, Failure is a part of success. You have to fail some so you can grow. And it's gotta be so f***ing hard to fail in front of millions of people, many of whom are rooting for you to fail for no reason. So what happens when the D'Amelios finally fail? Like someone that has OCD, that is also perfectionism, that 
that's really hard on yourself when you're mm -hmm. very young and you're growing up and you're trying to figure out who you are and wanting to be this perfect version of yourself and just always being disappointed. I feel like that was something I struggled with for a really long time. Yeah. What could have possibly been happening is the reality show could have possibly been filming the burnout that the two sisters were experiencing from everything they did the year prior in 2020. As we covered, they were doing so many brand deals and so many appearances and even still taking so many deals as quickly as they can through this newfound fame, afraid that it'll all burn away quickly. The brightest matches burn out the quickest. And it just seemed like in general they were exhausted exhausted and overwhelmed by everything that was being thrown at them when they were still minors. And because of TikTok's algorithm, where it automatically generates content for you at a fast pace, people can gain millions of followers overnight. But as quickly as creators rise, they can fall. It almost feels like I'm getting a taste of celebrity, but it's never consistent. And as soon as you get it, it's gone. And you're constantly trying to get it back, said Lauren Asna. Sorry if I said your last name wrong, a creator on TikTok. During the D'Amelio show, Dixie made a comment saying, my biggest goal professionally is probably to marry rich. Like, I really don't want to work anymore. There's no pressure for me to release music. The podcast is still a work in progress. And so right now, my biggest goal is professionally is probably to marry rich. Like, I really don't want to work anymore. Which caused her to face a lot of criticism and backlash. While this comment could have been a result of burnout, feeling overworked, if you look at the two sisters' schedules, how many brain deals they had to constantly do, how much work was being shoved down their throats, I could understand not wanting to work anymore, wanting to be saved from the stress of having to constantly work to keep the adults around you happy. But at the same time, her comments upset a lot of people as it came across once again as tone deaf and privileged. Dixie is rich. The quote share, I don't need to marry a rich man. I am a rich man. My mom said to me, you know, sweetheart, one day you should settle down and marry a rich man. And I said, mom, I am a rich man. But no, Dixie is already rich. She'd probably already retire as it is and live okay by most people's standards. Dixie D'Amelio wants to marry rich because she doesn't want to work anymore. But I'm waiting at the train station at 5 a.m. to go to uni because I live far, study in a different country, work to pay my own tuition, all by myself to make a living, a TikTok user wrote. While the reality show may have given a sneak peek into some of the ways that Dixie and Charlie D'Amelio were struggling, I don't think the show ultimately highlighted the D'Amelios in the best way. Their brand seemed to be relatable girl next door archetypes, but all the reality show seemed to do when getting a peek at their daily lives was highlight how unrelatable they truly are. Instead of letting social media run us, like we are living and doing and achieving and experiencing. I think you should experience it. You always say I want to experience things, but I don't think you actually want to experience things because you would experience it if you wanted to experience things. I don't know what you're talking about. Even a lot of the things they were struggling with was how they were too famous, which in the grand scheme of things is very different from most people's real life problems. And when Dixie says that she wants to stop working and just marry rich, it just reminds people of how rich and privileged she is in the first place to be able to say that she doesn't want to work anymore when she was, what, 21 at the time? And all of a sudden, people get the ick. The entire brand that they built around them of relatability just completely slips away. When I watched the Milio show, I felt like they hated each other. Honestly, I felt like I was watching a family that was just the personification of late stage capitalism and social media and how separated they were. They're always on their phones. There was no connection between them. And because of that, we didn't really see ourselves in them and instead just saw them for what they are, which is these aspirational figures who aren't appreciative of the platforms that they have and the power that they have and the money that they have. 
And that was the slow death of them, their brand and the way they were perceived. Their entire show was basically, I don't like what I'm doing. Though initially the D'Amelio show was surprisingly successful, becoming the most watched unscripted series among all first series titles in the genre on Hulu and winning an MTV movie and TV award for the best unscripted series, you know, for all of its very engaging moments. Actually aired last week, I was able to tune in to some riveting television. Is that what you did all day? Uh, yes. Well, I went to the gym. I don't have a can opener. Overall, The D'Amelio Show has received fairly critical reviews, given a 2.6 on IMDb and a 47% on Rotten Tomatoes. A review quote from Dorval Bedford about The D'Amelio Show said, The show remains inconsistent in a two-faced kind of way, trying to both manipulate the audience into feeling bad for the very rich and privileged D'Amelios, while also reveling in the celebrity drama the show wants to take seriously. The showrunners seem to actively hate the audience. Comments, presumably from fans or haters, pop up on screen whenever the D'Amelio sisters mention they face a lot of pressure as celebrities. Besides pointing the blame, at the audience members who gave the D'Amelios fame in the first place, the show doesn't explore any other reason as to why the D'Amelios may be feeling under pressure, which feels like it's not exploring any critical thought. Like, I don't know, maybe they're feeling under pressure because their parents, which should only be involved in their personal life, are getting involved in their business and their brand, overseeing everything to the point that when you look at so many different scenes of this reality show, it almost feels like the daughters aren't allowed to have any space when it comes to their career and their own brand. Where is the binder where she gets to be a kid and to make time for dance? Well, I don't know. Uh, she probably lost that one when you hired her an entire management team with an intern. And when you move to Los Angeles to the, to the, to the 10 million pound house, uh, I think that's the point where um, she became a slave for the social media regime. The parents are involved in it all. And that always works out super well for children in show business. I don't know, there's adults all around them, managers, film crew, agents, business partners, telling them what move they should be making, planning their schedules for them, their PR, their futures. I had to get ready for content filming. I had to have my content meeting, do a Q&A post podcast, fitting for my shoot the next day. I still have to do school. This is what's going on in my life. It's just kind of been like crazy. Yeah, that's not stressful at all. No, it couldn't be the people directly involved in Charlie and Dixie's life that are the reason for why their mental health is struggling or why they're feeling any pressure. 2021, this is the major things we're focusing on. So we have all partnerships. We have, you know, the different companies you're working with. They're doing a new brand deal every single day as teenagers, told to go to a different event red carpets, photo shoots, perfect their dancing, perfect their singing, and then present it all to be repackaged and sold as a new thing. But no, that's not why they're having panic attacks. It's just the hate comments that they're getting. Circle close, but do you let um, noise of the internet, like trolls, and do you read comments? Do you let that affect you? I do read comments. Yeah. I, again, like, if I read it today, it wouldn't affect me. Like if I'm reading I'm it when right I'm going now. through something, yeah. I'm like, oh my God, this is the worst thing in the entire world. Yeah. And then when I feel like that, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Might be something going on. I'm so <laughs> and at this point, as a viewer, I'm just thinking enough is enough. I mean, an overarching theme since season one has been Dixie being overworked, and while she reveals that she has PMDD, I think that since January of 2020, both of these girls have been going nonstop, partly due to their own fame, and the other part being their manager forcing brand deals on them. Since late 2020, every three videos Charlie posts is an ad. I do empathize massively with this, because could you imagine our childhood has just been stolen. 
one, um, relatively, by a bunch of people who you don't even know if they really are looking out for her. She's just got a bunch of like middle-aged men in her life at the age of 16 who are telling her what to do because it makes them and I mean, steal her money. That's scary. It's like something out of Black Mirror. That's the price of your soul, guys. How much is it? In November of 2021, the D'Amelio sisters starred in the Snap original web reality competition, Charlie versus Dixie, where they competed against each other in different challenges in order to win a cash prize of $50,000, went to a charity of the winner's choice. I'm Charlie. And I'm Dixie. And we're going head to head in a series of challenges for the ultimate family bragging rights. Harley came out on top, winning $30,000 for her charity, and Dixie won $20,000 for her charity. According to Snapchat, more than 20 million users tuned in to season one of Charlie vs. Dixie. In 2022, Charlie seemed to be revisiting her dance roots and doing more dance-related projects. In March, she appeared on the ABC special Step Into the Moves with Derek and Julianne Hugh, where she performed in a recreation of the Dirty Dancing sequence. Then in August, Charlie and her mother Heidi were announced as celebrity participants in the 31st season of Dancing with the Stars. The first ever mother-daughter duo on the show. They are the stars of the D'Amelio show on Hulu. Dancing with the Stars is a reality show competition where a bunch of different celebrities from a bunch of different backgrounds get together and dish it out on the dance floor. <laughs> That's a terrible way of explaining it. But basically, these celebrities are paired off with a professional dancer, and each week they have to perform. The goal is that the best dancer wins. A lot of people expressed their annoyance that Charlie was on the show because normally celebrities that compete on the show are novices when it comes to dancing. That seems to be the fun of watching the show, is to watch newer dancers try their hand at dancing. But since Charlie was already so skilled, she just kind of blew everyone else out of the water. But the other thing that is also kind of weird about it is why did Heidi feel the need to also go on Dancing with the Stars at the exact same time as her daughter? Can you let your daughter have her own thing, please? So and it's the first um, mother-daughter that's wow, this is incredible. Massive. That's huge. That's so. amazing. I don't know how I feel about that because I've never been in a position like this. I Heidi surprisingly made it far in the competition, ranking eight out of the 16, even though she didn't have a background in dance compared to her daughter. Though in an episode of the D'Amelio show, Mark and Heidi talk about how Dancing with the Stars apparently affected their marriage because Mark wasn't prepared for it. Mark said, if I would have known what I know now, now, but like, dude, she wants her career. Dancing with the Stars for me just created this huge shift in our family, which I wasn't prepared for. If I would have known what I know now, that like, dude, she wants her her career. She wants exactly what I've been doing over the last 20 years. Charlie and her partner made it to the finale and won the competition during that season of Dancing with the Stars. step forward the winners and new champions of dancing with the stars are charlie and mark Unfortunately, Charlie failed to capitalize off of the momentum following her win on Dancing with the Stars. She didn't continue to work within the dance industry or create a product within it as well. At this point, Charlie had been dancing competitively for well over a decade, but for whatever reason, her management team hasn't really pursued any business endeavors relating to dance besides her experience on Dancing with the Stars. She's never heavily promoted 
herself branching out in the world of dance, which would seem to seamlessly align with her brand. Instead, following her time on Dancing with the Stars, Charlie decided to release her debut single, titled If You Ask Me To, which premiered during the second season finale of The D'Amelio Show. Charlie releasing music ended up being a point of contention on The D'Amelio Show, since Dixie was known to be the musician of the family and was releasing music at the time, and Charlie was mainly known to be the dancer. In 2022, it was announced that Charlie would star as the lead in Villa Roadshaw Pictures and Ryan Kavanaugh's upcoming supernatural thriller film, Homeschool. So Charlie, scared to tell Dixie that she was releasing music, lied to her and said that she was attending acting classes instead of saying she was attending music sessions. Well, you can have coping, but yeah, we, we actually said I was going to acting class. But God, she's so pretty and funny and witty. I don't think that I'd stand a chance. Yeah! <laughs> there were some situations where I was just like, it's so weird. And then it all started connecting. When Charlie releases music, it's going to cause a lot of drama for me. When the family told Dixie that Charlie was releasing a single, Dixie was noticeably upset. I don't think you're gonna care, Dixie, honestly. Oh, don't put your freaking nail in my ear. I feel bad. At that exact same time, Charlie was releasing her single, Dixie was trying to release her debut album. But the project ended up going under the radar and didn't really get a lot of attention or publicity or really any favorable reviews, mainly because Dixie refused to use her TikTok account to promote the album. Everyone's trying to transition towards TikTok and I'm trying to transition the other way. It's funny because now everyone's telling me to use use TikTok. You need to use TikTok to blow up your music. But when I first started, I felt like I was looked down upon. I have a lot of nerves about that now because I want to be respected. But at the same time, this is what everyone's doing. She explained about refusing to promote her album on TikTok. Though the album went on to receive bad reviews for being what many called an underwhelming pop album that seemed a better fit for H&M music. Yikes. Still, Dixie promoted the album as an opening act for the band Big Time Rush. Um, Dixie, how does it feel to be on, you know, such a highly anticipated tour with these guys? You know, they've been gone since 2014, so all the eyes are going to be on you guys. How does that feel? <laughs> yes, Dixie. <laughs> it's really scary, but I'm... I'm just super excited. I think I think it's going to be a great experience for all of us. When Charlie released her single in October of 2022, the music video went on to only accumulate 5.4 million views, which of course is in general still a lot of views. But when you compare that to the debut single that Dixie released, Be Happy, which garnered over 114 million views, be a massive dip in popularity that the sisters were receiving, especially since the songs are kind of the same in quality, if, if you ask me. Not only were the D'Amelio music video views steadily dropping, but their YouTube and TikTok views were making a steady, drastic decline from the year 2022 and onward. This coincides with when the D'Amelios started posting less and less on TikTok. It could be said that the D'Amelios were trying to diversify too much, branch out, and yet in the process, they forgot where they came from. Whose fault was this? Well, personally, I blame Mark. <laughs> I blame Marky Mark. Considering every step along the way in this video, he has been at his daughter's sides, closely guiding all of their business decisions. So who is to blame when those decisions are bad ones? Mark would soon become even more financially involved with his daughter's brands, coinciding with what many consider the complete collapse of the D'Amelio brand, power of the empire that it was rising to be but never became. Ch 
Carly should have made a dancewear line. Like, why are they selling popcorn? They say yes to any business opportunity, and that takes away their credibility. Instead of that, instead of sitting at the drawing board and thinking, you know what, if I'm going to start a business, what's authentic to me? Instead of asking a question like, how can I help the most amount of people? How can I add something novel to the market that doesn't exist? How can I fill a need? Instead of doing that, they saw the cash cow and they milked it for all it was worth. Brand deals, commercials, TV show appearances, every quick, easy, get dirty rich kind of way that they could have made money, they did it, okay? And now they're reaping what they sowed because they're starting businesses after businesses and they're slowly fading to irrelevance. Leading into 2023, the D'Amelios continued on with partnering with a ton of different brands and even working with a lot of well-established fashion brands like Prada, who they developed a close working relationship with, Burberry, and Puma. No matter how many brands they worked with, it seemed like they could never get a big enough piece of the pie. There were times that we would partner with certain companies and, and there was someone else's creative direction. The way it works is we, we start off doing straight endorsement deals. So Charlie holds up a cup of Dunkin' Donuts. She loves Dunkin' Donuts. She gets a check for that. So does Ben Affleck. Apparently. Right. And now we're going to have more control over the products we make. And that's what's that's what I love. So Mark started the company D'Amelio Brands. In its essence, D'Amelio Brands is the idea that the D'Amelios don't have to rely on outside companies to give them partnerships and sponsorships. Instead, they can throw that out and start their very own companies and then promote those companies to their audience and followers. And instead of just getting a small payoff from these brands for sponsorships, sponsoring their product, they get all of the profit from selling their product to their audience. As Mark himself likes to put it, they own the IP. Mark, you started a, a shoe line and snacks aside from the show. What's it like as a, a family, you know, <laughs> controlling and working this business here? It's great. When we first started TikTok, I kind of felt like a fish out of water, <laughs> but I, my, my background is in brand. So this is the first thing that we've done over the last three years that I really feel comfortable. We want for our family, especially Dixie and Charlie, is to make this something that they have ownership in, but will stand the test of time so they can be involved in it as much or as little as they want, says Mark D'Amelio. Don't get caught up in this hamster wheel of deals. Hollywood will suck you dry if you let it. And that's one of the things, as the father, why we're doing this. I guess I'm just wondering what's the difference for his daughters, Charlie and Dixie, between them promoting for a bunch of other companies and and them promoting a bunch of companies started by their father's business that they have ownership in. Of course, they, I mean, hopefully, are getting a bigger piece of the pie, but they're still getting caught on a hamster wheel of deals, still getting sucked dry. It's just their father now who's setting up these agreements instead of other companies. But allegedly, from the D'Amelio's perspective, having ownership in these companies helps to protect them just in case their social media fame starts to fade away. We know nothing lasts forever. There's going to be ups and downs. Charlie D'Amelio told Forbes. So it seems that the family is trying to stretch their fame as far as possible by capitalizing on their popularity at the moment. The thing is, people are getting tired of it. It is actually bizarre how many businesses the D'Amelios have started within the last year that they have been constantly promoting, incessant and nonstop. And guess what? The influence that you had stops influencing influencing people. And so then they don't buy what you're selling. September of 2022, the D'Amelios announced D'Amelio Brands LLC. We started off with Charlie doing $50 TikTok promotions, and then it moved to bigger deals. Then Mark D'Amelio on CNBC's Squawk Box. Yeah, it's been, it's been the natural progression. We started off with Charlie doing uh, $50 TikTok promotions and then it uh, moved to bigger deals and then we partnered with companies with, with a little bit of equity and now we're started this brand company where we're going to go out and uh, create 
a bunch of different brands and own the IP and we took on a bunch of great investors and and it's it's a little bit surreal and it's a, it's it's very exciting. The background looks like either a music executive or an evil villain in his lair. Very Hollywood-esque, especially coming from a guy who lived in Connecticut only a few years ago and then got successful off of his daughters. Stabilio Brands is playing on creating a bunch of brands in a variety of different industries, including fashion, beauty, and lifestyle. The venture also announced a $6 million seed round of funding from outside investors, including investors Fanatics CEO Michael Rubin, entrepreneur Richard Rosenblatt, and Apple's Senior Vice President of Services Eddie Q, Lionsgate Entertainment Head John Feltheimer, and United Talent Agency also backed the venture. And so now the company has a $100 million valuation. For what? What is the value of it besides putting more money into the D'Amelio's pocket? A bunch of different really great investors. We put a valuation out there based on where we think we're, we, we are going to go with this thing at $100 million. And we raised, we could have raised a lot more, but we, we held it at five and actually just extended okay. it to, so we sold 6% of it and we raised a lot of money. And that's going right into to creating a creating these brands. And why do you need six million dollars of other people's money to start this family brand venture? It feels so, so weird to me. Like Mark's weird, not get rich quick scheme, but get ultra, ultra rich quick scheme. All of his daughter's fame and success and off of other investors' money. Because as a family, if they genuinely want wanted to start a business all together, they're rich enough to start a business together with their own money and get a genuine product-based business going that they're passionate about. Instead, Marky Mark raised $6 million so that through the D'Amelio brand, he could start 10 different businesses all at once. Also, just having more investors is always a bad idea, especially with such a new company, especially if those investors don't understand the industry you're in. Also, if you don't perform well and are continually upsetting these investors, they can just push you out of the company. The problem with this is that no matter how rich, powerful, and successful these investors and Marky Mark is, they don't know the new and budding world of social media, and they don't know the ins and outs of Charlie and Dixie's audience as well as Charlie and Dixie might. So when it comes to creating and promoting brands, they might not be as well versed at what tactics will work compared to someone like Dixie and Charlie, aka the influencers themselves. And promoting on TikTok is still a crucial part of the D'Amelio brand's business. Although the D'Amelios are still looking to expand to making money beyond TikTok, Mark has spoken about how crucial TikTok has been to creators looking to monetize their content. TikTok has been incredible. Um, Instagram is doing a great job. Um, we also, you know, we work with Triller, who's who's going to be going public soon. Um, and and we I don't really have we don't have favorites. According to Forbes, Charlie and Dixie were the highest earning TikTok creators in 2021, making a combined 27.5 million. In 2023, Dixie made 11.5 million. Charlie made 17.5 million. You're also the highest paid TikToker in the world. <laughs> making $17.5 million a year. How do you feel about that? It's definitely something that I never expected to happen. Um, does not feel very real, but I'm very happy with what I do and I love what I do. And I'm glad that this was the path that I have taken because I have a lot of fun with this. Mark even told Squawk Box that his daughters can earn six figures per sponsored post. So you guys have done deals with Puma, Valentino, Dunkin' Donuts. What, what were those prices? Just, just, just to put it on the table. How, how much is a, is, is a TikTok post worth these days? It's, it's six figures. Six figures a post? Yeah. Yes. Not for me. I'm, I'll do it for for very cheap. But uh, my 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 daughters get a get a 
get a decent amount of money. So, And yet, instead of listening to his daughters or continuing to let his daughters profit off of the massive amount of money that they were making, Mark created a brand where some of that money would also go through him. Think about it. If Charlie is getting paid to do a sponsored post that makes six figures, then that money is getting saved for Charlie. Maybe a percentage is getting taken away from managers and other industry experts who help facilitate that deal. But most of the money goes directly to Charlie. If Mark starts the D'Amelio brands and is the CEO and co-founder, creates all these different brands that he has his daughters promote, well, when people go to buy from the brands that his daughter promotes, Mark directly profits from it, not just his daughters. So creating the D'Amelio brands, in my opinion, was a way for Mark to ensure that he could profit off of his daughter's endeavors and not just solely his daughters. And in May of 2023, the D'Amelio Brands announced the global launch of its very first brand, D'Amelio Footwear. Marky Mark. Heidi, Charlie, Dixie could launch whatever brand they wanted. They had six million dollars, a thousand choices at their fingertips. So what choice did they decide to make all of these options for their very first brand to promote to their followers? Could it be something new, revolutionary, life-changing, and helpful that was going to transform the lives of people around them? That's a lot to ask for anyone. I mean... But nay, the first company that D'Amelio Brands launched was a hundred dollar footwear. We always thought shoes and beauty were the two categories we wanted to explore first. As we were developing D'Amelio brands, the D'Amelios said, as a family, we all came together. And as the ideas started to flow, it became even more clear that shoes were the right place to start. Like everything to do, it was definitely a family discussion, a decision as a unit and team. The family worked with designers to come up with various styles of shoes revolutionary styles of shoes, shoes that you've never seen before. They've never been done before. Sandals, sneakers, boots, among other styles. Family claimed to be extremely involved from the early inception of this product. The shoe game is so strong. I mean, y'all walked in here and the whole room was like, oh my God. So D'Amelio Footwear is something that I think everyone has been extremely excited for. Mm -hmm. I think the next few drops are by far like my favorites and I'm so excited to just live in them and have everyone else wear them. Wanted to ensure that the shoes were something we would wear, but that they were also really comfortable. It was also so important to us that we try to keep the quality while producing the shoes at a lower price point so it's attainable for our audience. That's a little bit laughable considering the shoes are from $79 to $100, which is not an affordable price point in my opinion. They also talk about how unoriginal D'Amelio footwear is as a name. It's the same thing as the reality show being called the D'Amelio show, then their brand being called the D'Amelio brand. It's all so boring. Who wants to buy shoes that are just called D'Amelio footwear? Call it Charlie's Kicks or I, I don't know, like come up with some sort of original name. The D'Amelios held an exclusive launch party in LA for their footwear brand in the heart of Hollywood and invited a bunch of celebrity guests. <laughs> that in itself feels like an issue because it feels like they're focused on getting a bunch of A-lister and celebrity approval on this brand when in reality to have sales and success in a brand they need their audience's approval for their audience to just like the brand and think it's cool or else regardless it's just not going to sell well. 
So it just goes to show already how they're just focusing on the wrong things. Another example of this is the price point. Influencers who tend to know their audience well, and they'll often sell products that are affordable and fit well with their demographic. For example, the Demilio's demographic is young people who are probably going to have to ask their parents to buy them things. So who's the target audience? I think it's a little bit of everyone, <laughs> you know? I think it's been super fun to, you know, kind of get ideas from everyone. Like these, these ones, when you take a picture, they're gonna glow. Yeah. And that's, that's I so walked in and cool. I thought those would, were you. The entries in the D'Amelio footwear catalog, by contrast, have price points as high as $109 for a pair of platform sandals. And that's before shipping and taxes. What's the price point? Like, I mean, design says a lot about what you're trying to reach, but the price also does too. Anywhere between $80 uh, to, a, to $200, but mostly in the, in the $100 to $120 okay. range. You know, in talks of this, I talked to my friends that, you know, just went to college. I was like, what were you wearing at graduation? What would you spend on a pair of boots? What is comfortable in your range? If you compare this to a company like Feastables by Mr. Beast, which sells affordable chocolate bars in an easy to reach store, Walmart, regardless of the ethics or quality of the product, which I'm not familiar with, Mr. Beast knew his audience when he created it, what price point they were willing to buy from, and even more importantly, the fact that his young audience probably didn't have the ability or purchase power to buy products on their own. They needed parent permission and parent capital. So selling a product in a place like Walmart where parents shop already and are already buying things, children can easily add the chocolate bar into their parents' shopping cart and then support their favorite YouTuber, Mr. Beast. You compare that to D'Amelio Footwear, which has a similar audience demographic. Yet they're selling shoes online only and for over $100, which means that... 10 year olds are going to have to go onto the website, add these $100 plus shoes to their cart, and then ask their parents to buy them for them. Maybe some parents would be willing to do this, but there's just so many hoops for them to jump through that it's clear they've lost the plot. In fact, even Mark admitted this in an interview when they started doing pop up sales of their footwear, saying that it's hard to sell direct to consumer, somewhat insinuating that their direct to consumer sales of their footwear brand had not been performing well, though those involved in D'Amelio footwear have refused to comment on the success of the brand, seemingly pretending like it's been a hit, even though I think we all know better. A representative for the brand declined to share specific sales numbers, though they claimed that in under a week, Melio Footwear had garnered 114 million impressions from just Charlie and Dixie's Instagram, TikTok, and Snap accounts. But as we know from the Ace family's many business failures and the coverage that I did on that, impressions definitely do not equal sales. Quality of viewership is way more important than how many views or impressions an influencer is getting, especially when it comes to sale conversions. If you have 500,000 bots and 500,000 10-year-olds who are viewing your content, how many people are going to purchase your $100 shoes? Very, very little. August of 2023, the D'Amelio Brands announced a $5 million strategic investment in the consumer-focused media and tech firm Fifth Growth Fund, which was intended to help them expand into the food and beverage sector with an imminent launch of D'Amelio Foods. Mark said about the launch into the food sector, some of our family's best memories are made at home. In the kitchen or snacking in the family room. 
Instagram. The products we plan to launch under Demelio Foods are inspired by our favorite flavors and snacks. We're excited for people to try them out and create lasting memories of their own. Soon after, Demelio Foods released the brand Be Happy Snacks, which is a flavored popcorn range, to Walmart retail stores and websites. With Be Happy Snacks, which was inspired by Dixie's hit song, we're aiming to spark joy and satisfy cravings with fun, unexpected snacks that bring people together, Mark said about the brand. By collaborating with Walmart, we're able to offer our products to a community of food lovers who celebrate trying new flavors and products nationwide. Hey girls! Today we have Be Happy Snacks Popcorn in the shade, in the shade cotton, cotton candy. <laughs> in the shade cotton candy. And the <laughs> You can purchase exclusively at Walmart. After the mistake that was D'Amelio footwear, Be Happy Snacks seemed to follow exactly in the Mr. Beast Feastables footsteps, selling an affordable snack and partnering with Walmart to sell the product in an easy to reach store. But the promotion of Be Happy Snacks ended up causing major controversy for the D'Amelios, further proving that taking the brands into their own hands would solve all of the D'Amelios' stresses and problems. To promote Be Happy Snacks, for whatever reason, someone, someone thought it would be a good idea to have Charlie pose as a Walmart cashier. A viral video of Charlie posing as a Walmart cashier drew backlash from social media where people called her out for cosplaying a working class life as a multimillionaire. Which in general, why do influencers always think it's a good idea to do this? Charlie D'Amelio was recorded posing for photos as she scanned bags of popcorn for the Be Happy brand with an employee vest and name tag on. It seemed to be an idea for the brand's promotion as on the Be Happy branding page, they featured Charlie Charlie in her Walmart uniform, writing in text, us checking people out, knowing they have their new favorite snack. Somehow thinking people were going to love seeing Charlie as a Walmart employee. And that would make them want to go to the store and buy Be Happy snacks. Where... How, why do influencers do this? Do they get some sort of thrill doing it, knowing that they're a multimillionaire and never have to survive off of a working class life? Especially when so many people get backlash for doing this, why do they always think it'll be different for them? I don't even hate Charlie D'Amelio like that, but there will always be something so disconnected and sinister about literal millionaires cosplaying working class people who make next to nothing. Cosplaying as a cashier at Walmart while being a multimillionaire is the cringiest video topic, LMAO. Hi guys, it's Charlie, and today we're going to see how normal people live today. While now, both Charlie and Dixie are adults and should, in general, know better, know how people would react to this, especially since they've been on social media for a good minute at this point. Knowing the context of who is behind the Be Happy brand, I also just can't help but wonder who Whose idea this was for them to do this and how much of it was ultimately up to them. It's another demonstration of how Harley and Dixie D'Amelio's brands were slowly becoming completely out of their control and also scarily into their father's control as he develops all of these brands that they now have to promote. D'Amelio brands trademarked the names It's All Right with the intentions on selling skincare, hair care, and beauty products products. Though the D'Amelios haven't officially announced this brand to the public, a lot of influencers and celebrities have created skincare brands and skincare is a growing industry. Though in general, the brands that tend to be the most successful are the ones where it seems like the face of the brand has a genuine passion for it. And it remains to be seen whether or not people are getting tired of so many skincare brands being started by various influencers and celebrities. 
bodies, especially if they've shown no prior interest, will the general public turn away from them and see it as just a cash grab? Fam Fam merch is where the D'Amelios sell their family merch, which is strange because first off, the family doesn't often promote this merch, but also on this family merch website, they should have at least merch for Charlie and Dixie to be able to promote as individuals instead of just the collective family merch. Also, the website itself just doesn't have the best logo. Like it's not recognizable to the D'Amelios and the merch designs are so terrible. It's clear that just not a lot of effort was put into it whatsoever. Dixie has most recently partnered with a company called My Muse, which she has done sponsorships with in the past. Don't you love how you can see the full brand in the right way? to create her own drink called Passion, which is sold at a bunch of different places. Now, I'm not like a hardcore Dixie watcher. I'm not a hardcore Dix writer, sorry. But from the content I've watched, Dixie doesn't talk a ton about drinks or liking soda drinks. So compared to Charlie's partnership with Dunkin' Donuts, which seemed very natural and authentic, since she talked so much about liking Dunkin' Donuts and their coffee, the creation of this drink definitely seems very random. Though the packaging is very beautiful and it looks pretty cool. D'Amelios have also made business deals to become involved with other companies as well. The D'Amelios struck a deal to become advisors and brand ambassadors for Light Tricks in exchange for equity and an upfront cash payment. And then we started looking at deals that were kind of hybrid endorsement deals plus equity. And there's, I think we have probably um, seven, eight of those that and one is Step, one is Light Tricks, uh, one is Halo Dog Collar. The terms of the deal were not disclosed. It's interesting that they'd become advisors in another company because their own business endeavors, even in social media, which they're supposed to be experts in, have seemingly floundered. Light Tricks is a photo editing app centralized company and owns several popular photo and video editing apps like Facetune and Video Leap. What? I am special. The D'Amelio family has, in the four years that they've gained social media fame and success, also gained quite a bit of a fortune. And instead of investing that into their own companies and ventures that they start, they decided to invest that into other companies in the hopes to further grow their wealth. Talk stars launching a venture capital fund in my crystal ball a few years ago, but here you are. 444 Capital, talk to us about the mission and what you're trying to do here. Yeah, so we, we partnered with a group of really smart investors and they're putting money into really cool companies that all have a great story. So in early 2023, they launched a family fund called 444 Capital. The family fund is a $25 million fund led by all the family members along with some other people. They've made some investments into some wholesome companies like children's nutrition companies, different health companies, and also some weird investments like the company Hero Bread which is a low carb food company, you know, because we we need more of those out there. I say as I'm eating hot Cheetos, love how when it features all of the investors on the website, it shows all of the D'Amelio family members following specifically listing off how many followers they have. Because if there's anything I've learned from watching Shark Tank, uh, when you're looking for investors, you shouldn't look for investors that have the most industry expertise and connections in the niche and industry that you're involved in or have connections in manufacturing and marketing. No, so you need to look for investors who have a lot of followers. That's what it's all about.
So with the influence of Mark D'Amelio, Charlie went from being a teenager, filming herself in her bedroom, dancing to fun TikToks, to promoting her family's multiple brands, having multi-multi-million dollar brand deals, and even investing in her own portfolio in a family fund. So my concern is, see the red flags or the writing on the wall, you start to wonder, when does this become exploitation? When will we learn from the child stars of the past with their parent managers and how much they were taking advantage of and see the signs as the patterns repeat themselves as the child stars of today have their childhood stripped away from them their parents find new ways to get as much money and power from them as possible all the while the children lose their parents as well in the process in an interview, Mark spoke about how him and his wife balance being business influences on their daughter and being parents, which in my opinion, no parent should have to balance. That's the hardest part is when to be mom and dad and when to really have us use our age, our experience and our wisdom to really push through when we know intuitively it's the best thing for Dixie and Charlie and when to back off and just be, hey, I want to be dad right now it's the hardest balance because you're dealing with young women who you were trying to do the best thing for them and you have to know when to push and when is it is this just hey i don't want to get up for school in the morning kind of a, a moment or is this a true uh mental health situation and i know they're going to look back on this ride as it being incredible. So what you're saying is you have moments when you're not acting like Dixie and Charlie's father. When you act like you know what's best for them in business and influence their decisions. A business you're actively profiting off of and have a financial interest in, therefore cannot be unbiased about as you're influencing them in their decisions and how much pressure you're putting on them. Wrong here, but a parent should just be a parent. Dude, I have a tough job because everyone thinks like I'm the dad that's pushing my kids to to be in this, but I actually do the opposite. I, mean, I actually have to go do, <laughs> do both. Like sometimes I'm like, dude, this is a really good opportunity. Yeah. And I gotta, I have to be a dad and wonder whether they're just being a kid who like is in college and doesn't want to get up yeah. for an early class yeah. or whether there's really something Wrong. emotional yeah. going on. But I also know I have to I have to look them and everybody else in the face 20 years from now, make sure that your money was protected yeah. and that you guys are in a great place with all the opportunity you have and that you made the most of the opportunity. So Charlie and I will get into battles about that. Mark claimed that he never wanted to be the stage parents that people think of when they picture parents managing their kids' careers. But the thing is, when he says that, he's admitting to the fact that him and his wife manage his children's careers. They've pushed them to work constantly, to promote businesses constantly, to promote them so that the parents themselves can create a brand. And all of it is very concerning. And on top of that, the parents have even admitted that they struggle to listen to their own children when they say that they don't want to work or they want to take time off. But over this period of three years, they have learned that one, Heidi and I have unconditional love for them. So anytime we ask them for something, it's never about it's with good us. But I think over the, this time, even though we don't know Hollywood and we didn't know this space, I think a lot of the things from being in a brand business was applicable. And we've made some great, some really good yeah, you've decisions. Made some smart decisions. And I they agree. kind of look at us and go, oh, okay, dad. Yeah, you're not, like, I you're trust not you. an idiot. I think listening has been something that I've worked really hard on, Heidi said in an interview. And there have been moments where the girls have been like, let's not talk about work. And I have to really hear them and listen to them and respect that because they're right. The fact that the parents of the D'Amelio family have admitted that their children have asked them to be normal parents and not push them about work is just super concerning. 20 years from now and say, hey, you took advantage of the opportunities, right? You got enough money in the bank. You got, you know, I'm like, they don't understand that life that there's, they're going to have kids and their kids are going to have kids and that there's, that there can do so much with this opportunity. So that's, so I am, I think both Heidi and I are constantly balancing out having to 
know 20 years from now we're gonna have to look them in the eyes and say did we did we navigate this right yeah. and 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 so part of it is the pushing and like, guys, come on, this is this is a great opportunity. Mark claimed that he brought in agents and managers so that he and Heidi could have time to just be parents, though. He did put an effort into making sure that we set up the teams properly. And we did put an infrastructure in place for business managers. That stuff's really important. Business managers, agents. We knew we didn't know everything. You read between the lines, Mark is saying that he said up all of this for his daughters. He made all the business decisions and put all the managers in place. I don't want to be the focal point. I don't enjoy it. I like to do my own thing. Yeah. Um, having cameras in your house is very odd. You never really get used to it. And financially, so many bad things can happen with their parents having so much control over them. From the agents, the managers, the D'Amelio brand. Everyone understands that you can make a career on social media. So yeah. I think it's up to parents to get involved, but not to be the center of attention. I think Heidi and I have tried to balance it out where we're involved with, with the process, but we never try to overshadow the girls. Parents deeply entangled themselves in their daughter's businesses, brands, lives. That feels deeply wrong. Now at this point, it'll be virtually impossible for Charlie and Dixie D'Amelio to branch off and try and develop their own career paths and identity and individual brands that aren't so intricately linked to their parents. I see my parents way more than any 19 year old should. <laughs> we spend a lot of time together and it's great. I love it. But there is the other side of things that's like, well, they're asking us all to do this, but it's like, well, if, it sounds so horrible to say, but like, if I don't do it, they won't be able to do it. It's like, sometimes that's a little hard. First of all, Dixie and Charlie have admitted that they don't like working together. In a lie detector video done by Vanity Fair, both sisters agreed that they are not in a good environment when they're working together. Yeah. Do you like working with me? Sometimes, today. Today? In general? No. Telling the truth. <laughs> We, I, we get along when we're chilling and doing nothing. You think we're in a good like environment when we're working together? Mm -hmm. True. Makes a lot of sense. Even when families work together or start a business together, it's usually in a professional setting where there's clear boundaries in place. These sisters have had to go full time into a reality show, start tons of brands together, are constantly doing photo shoots together, appearances, they're working together all the time. Their personal and business life have become completely blurred and that cannot be healthy for their relationship. And what is it that's leading to kind of the confusion within the family? Is it something that is easy to point out or is it something that's a little bit more like deep down? I think everyone was just on such different pages for so long mm -hmm. and we were all so busy that no one was really having the conversations that we should have had and you know when you work with your family sometimes you don't get to be with each other without any cameras as much as you'd like so it's like you know, after so long of miscommunications or not talking to each other, the first time you see each other is like on camera and then emotions are are raised and then you say things that you don't mean and it's like you really just get to see how that can affect a family. And who pushed for this? Their parents. It just feels so incredibly icky to me. Ultimately, it seems like too much was forced upon the daughters of the D'Amelio family too quickly, and they just got 
burnt out. And in turn, their fans got burnt out on them. Though the social media engagement of the D'Amelio family is slipping away more and more, the D'Amelios have been okay with stepping away more frequently from TikTok. There have been discussions about a TikTok ban happening within the US. And in response to a potential TikTok ban, Charlie D'Amelio said, you have to remember that social media comes and goes. There's new apps, there's new people, there's exciting new trends. You don't always get to be first in line for everything. TikToker Noah Glenn responded to Charlie's statements saying, keep in mind, Charlie's entire career was built on this app. So imagine you join TikTok and you end up blowing up. Like to the point where you're on Dancing with the Stars and hosting the Kids' Choice Awards. Now imagine after achieving all that success from one app, you completely turn your back on it. If your name is Charlie D'Amelio, you don't have to imagine this. That being said, the family has made multiple statements saying that they've been afraid of social media slipping away from them. So it's not surprising to see them make statements about their focus being outside of social media slowly and more gradually. So will Will this tactic work out for the family in the long run, or will it just increase the likelihood that they slip further and further into irrelevance? Mark D'Amelio said in an interview, I remember people going viral on Vine, and then all of a sudden it disappeared. So we definitely look to expand through other platforms and other areas. We didn't want to keep all our eggs in one basket. At the end of the day, we're part of a family business, and if they don't want to do social media, they can always fall back on that, the mother said as well about not relying on social media. So both of the parents have been slowly encouraging the daughters to not rely on TikTok fame, at least from what it sounds like according to their interviews. But on top of that, both of the daughter's YouTube views have been abysmal lately. This is great, but you don't, like, social media comes and goes, and I've always had that in the back of my mind, like, one day no one could care about who I am. So yeah. let's just appreciate the moment. So with all of these new brands coming out, will they have the same audience and promotion power that they used to have? If you just walk away from the platform that gave you any sort of fame, leverage, power, then you have no way to sell your business or continue on. There wasn't really any transitional period for the D'Amelios. They didn't wait long enough for their businesses to build up a strong enough brand or become successful enough to not rely on their social media fame. They just somehow thought they were now above the platform that gave them everything they started with. They were now too famous and too rich for the relatable brand. They did too much to also post regular TikTok content. But in the process, they lost the very thing that gave them everything. Awesome TikToker who makes content on influencer marketing by the name of at Be Better Company did a 10 minute deep dive on TikTok about the downfall of the D'Amelios and how the oversaturation of their brand and the unenthusiastic and inauthentic way that they marketed their many businesses caused their audience to lose trust in them, ultimately leading to the degradation of their brand. His initial video led to Charlie blocking him on TikTok. It turns out that Charlie D'Amelio was not happy that I discussed why her brand has completely and utterly failed from a marketing perspective because she just blocked me on TikTok. So something about their current situation and how the public is noticing their, well, public failures is currently hitting home for them. The concept of celebrity has changed with the evolution of social media. Now more power than ever is in the hands of the people. Fans and followers have the power to build you up. They also can decide where they want to put their time and attention. Followers are not just a number, even if followers are as massive of a number as 150 million. If you don't see that number as individual people, instead see them as a dollar sign or something to give 
give you more fame and fortune for yourself or your family, eventually people are going to notice the grift. They're going to see you as inauthentic, as trying to cash in on a quick buck, and eventually people will tire from you. The very thing that built you up can so easily break you down. That may just be the story of what happened to the D'Amelio brand and why it failed. And that's all for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you made it all the way to the end of this video, comment flaming hot Cheeto and let's confuse everyone else who never made it to the end of this video. <laughs> Thank you so much to my team who helped me in the creation process of this video and I hope you are all doing well. Till the next one, see you then. Bye!